Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder, and today we're going to top off our discussion of the Progressive Era by discussing how the federal government gets involved and talk about reformers in the White House. So your learning targets are to discuss Theodore Roosevelt's administration, uh, Taft's administration, Wilson's administration, and then the legacy of the Progressive Era. So we're going over three presidents today. So just a little background on Roosevelt. He is a basically a secretary of the Navy. He is, you know, a government bureaucrat, works for the president, works for McKinley. But he goes away from doing that stuff and forms a group called the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War, which we'll talk about uh, in our next topic. And basically, he's a bureaucrat riding around with a bunch of guys on horseback in Cuba uh, trying to kick the Spanish out. And so he is a very, very, very tough man. He becomes governor of New York and pushes for progressive reforms, but this annoys a lot of Republican leaders, and they convince McKinley to actually make him vice president. And in 1900, McKinley wins again over William Jennings Bryan, but McKinley is shot and killed a few months later, and so Roosevelt actually becomes the president of the United States. And uh, the New York people, their worst nightmare comes true. So Roosevelt's thing, uh, his policy is called the square deal. And square means fair in this instant. It's not like, oh, well, why are there only three basic ideas when a square has four sets? Square means fair. He wants to give the American people a fair shake. And so their three basic ideas are the conservation of natural resources, the control of corporations, and consumer protection. And this aims at helping middle-class citizens get a fair chance at the American dream. So Roosevelt eventually uh, intervenes, the federal government, um, on the side of labor, uh, laborers in labor disputes. Um, so he intervenes in labor disputes, uses federal power, like in 1902, he had to deal with an an the anthracite crisis where the coal miners were going to go on strike for some rights that they thought that they needed. Uh, he sympathizes with the workers, but he also understands that we need coal for the coming winter to keep everybody in the Northeast warm or else businesses would shut down, people would freeze to death. Coal is how we kept things warm. And so he talks to, to the labor owners, the coal mine owners, and they refuse to budge. And so he threatens to send in federal troops to control the mines. And then this forces the owners to give in to the workers' demands. And so for the first time in this, uh, you know, period of industrialization, the federal government intervened on the side of workers for once. And so he goes ahead and basically takes control of a lot of corporations that were doing these shady business practices. He protects them from the threats of organized labor, but he's, he, labor, but he's also hard on them. He passes the Hepburn Act, or he signs the Hepburn Act, which gives the Interstate Commerce Commission more power over the railroads after the Supreme Court had kind of stripped, stripped it away over the 1890s. Uh, the ICC can now set limit set or limit shipping costs for railroads, ferries, bridge, tolls, and oil pipelines. And uh, each of their decisions has the force or the weight of a court order. So this pleases progressives by bringing these powerful railroads under control. And Roosevelt and his administration come to be known as trust busters, but it, they didn't bust all of the trust. They only busted the bad ones and left the good ones alone, the ones that drove prices down. One of the most famous ones he did right away was he takes on J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Company, which was going to become a railroad monopoly, and forces it to split into smaller companies. And then finally, we get to consumer protections, and his major one came after The Jungle was published. Remember, The Jungle talked about the meat uh, processing plants and the stockyards in Chicago. After this disgusted everybody in the country, he passes the Meat Inspection Act, which is where federal agents inspect their meat and processing plants, and the Pure Food and Drug Act is also passed, which means that laws uh, need to be created for other foods, labeling, and impure foods, 
and the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, still enforces this law today and monitors companies and makes sure that uh, people aren't hurt by products that are out there. And they also make sure that uh, drugs that are brought to the market have to be tested by the FDA and approved by the FDA first. Uh, then we get to conservation of natural resources and Roosevelt admires the ideas of John Muir, who is the uh, environmentalist who leads to, his efforts lead to the creation of national parks. But Roosevelt disagrees with him that we should preserve these areas. These areas have valuable resources in them and Roosevelt thinks we need to protect them, but we also need to uh, use them. And so the whole idea of conservation, which is conserving the resources and not using them up and making sure we can replenish them versus preserving them and leaving them all alone, Roosevelt ends up being a conservationist and he agrees on the rational use ideas of Gifford Pinoche. And so Roosevelt is basically credited with starting our national park system, although those weren't started until 1916 officially. He sets aside over 100 million acres of these wildlands and forests out west for parks and lumber usage. And he and the federal government also passed the National Reclamation Act because water is such a scarce resource out west. Uh, different people were fighting over it. Miners would divert rivers to them. Farmers would divert rivers to them for use. And it would lead to these bitter conflicts over who actually had in who was in charge of the water. And so the federal government finally says we're going to be in charge of the water since you guys can't use it correctly. And they build dams and aqueducts uh, to divert water to places that need it out west. Taft moves in. Roosevelt wanted to run for another term, but he promised that he would only do uh, his two terms, even though he was only elected once in 1904. Um, he still served the remainder of McKinley's terms and said that's his two terms. He's done. So William, William Howard Taft replaces Roosevelt because Roosevelt endorses him. So everybody votes for Taft in 1908. And Roosevelt, since Taft worked for him, he expects all of his policies to remain in place. But Taft goes ahead and sets his own agenda as a president should do. And he ends up being more conservative than Roosevelt. So some of Taft's policies are the Payne Aldrich, uh, Aldrich Act, which does not lower tariffs as much as Roosevelt would have liked. The Man Elkins Act gives government direct control over telephone and telegraph rates. And also, he brings twice as many lawsuits against corporations as Roosevelt because he doesn't distinguish between good trusts and bad trusts. And this infuriates Roosevelt, so much so that Roosevelt says, I'm going to run for president again in 1912. So this issue between Taft and Roosevelt splits the Republicans. The Roosevelt and the progressives leave the Republican Party and start their own. He tours the country and speaks of new nationalism, which one which brings up my um, all time favorite Roosevelt event is when he was shot on his way to a speech in Milwaukee, but then went ahead and gave the speech anyway. He goes up and says, you know, I'm, I've been shot. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you my full speech tonight, but I can give you. Um, so he's a really tough guy. <laughs> and um, the progressives, um, he claims himself, Roosevelt claims himself as strong as a bull moose. So the progressives go ahead and start the progressive party. But can a third party have a large impact on a presidential election? We learned from the populace that it can, but not large enough. Here, the name calling and bitter attacks split the Republican vote and Democrat Woodrow Wilson is elected. Even though Wilson did not win the majority of the popular vote, he still gains over four times as many electoral votes as Roosevelt, who comes in second, and Taft, who comes in a distant third. So in 1913, President Wilson comes to uh, the office. He is a college professor, and he's been in education his whole life, and he um, learns how to run the government, or he studies political science. And then his ideas that he wants to enact basically come to be known as the New Freedom Plan, which is essentially the same thing as Roosevelt's New Nationalism. 
He wants to place stricter government controls on corporations and give more freedom to small businesses, which basically are the lifeblood of America. So Wilson attacks what he calls the triple wall of privilege, which are tariffs, banks, and trusts. Uh, the tariffs, he passes the Underwood Tariff Act, which lowers tariffs. Remember, Democrats wanted lower tariffs so that consumers could choose between foreign and domestic goods. And this also forces American companies to lower their prices if they were um, artificially set too high to make a profit. But now the government is missing a lot of money that it was bringing in off that tax. So how do we make up that money? The Democrats go ahead and pass the 16th Amendment. And the 16th Amendment to the Constitution enacts an income tax, and it's a graduated income tax. This graduated income tax means that wealthier people will pay a higher percentage of their income compared to poor people. So not only are they paying more money outright, they're paying a larger percentage of their money. Banking. There's no U.S. authority to establish any monetary policy right now. The banks and wealthy bankers can set interest rates as they please. And so this Federal Reserve Act that is passed places the banks under control of a Federal Reserve Board. And so this is basically our national bank today. It sets monetary policy, interest rates, supervises banks, and ends up with um, prevents too much money from being into the bank's hands and that's still around today uh, controlling the monetary policy of the United States and in order to help with the trusts he creates the Federal Trade Commission which monitors any sorts of business practices that might lead to a monopoly and also monitors uh, misleading advertising of products in in order to strengthen the antitrust legislation and powers that the government had Congress goes ahead and passes the Clayton Antitrust Act. So we've got the Sherman Antitrust Act passed in 1890s, and then Clayton Antitrust Act is passed now, which strengthens previous antitrust laws and allows unions to operate more freely by not being classified as trusts. And so both of these are still in effect today. The FTC is very instrumental in regulating internet purchasing and prosecutes company that, uh, companies that trade stocks dishonestly. As far as workers' rights go during uh, Wilson's uh, presidency, we already said the Clayton Antitrust Act prevents labor unions from being attacked as trusts. The Working Man's Compensation Act gives compensation, uh, workers' comp, to disabled civil service employees, so government employees. The Adamson Act was passed to avert a railroad strike, and it limits the workday to eight hours for rail workers. And unfortunately, he didn't intervene on the side of all workers in the Ludlow massacre. Coal, coal miners in Colorado strike after demanding uh, and safer working conditions, and the strike continues through the winter. Most of the people set up tents outside the mine in order to just stay there and be off the job. And in April of the following spring, the Colorado National Guard fires on these people and sets fire to the tent city and kills 26 men, women, and children. Only then does Wilson restore federal troops, uh, send federal troops to restore order in that area. So what is progressivism's legacy? It lasts until World War I, which starts in 1914. The U.S. joins in 1917, and reformers divert their efforts to support the war, and afterwards progressivism virtually ends. Different achievements gained. We have political reforms. We have more government regulation of business. We have more workers' rights. We have environmental protection out west and the conservation of uh, different resources. And finally, the government is going to protect consumers. So that is a large amount of information done in about 15 years. So make sure you reveal all this stuff, fill out those learning targets, and we'll talk about it in class uh, next time I see you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.